Hey, listen, I, I quit. Yeah, I'm going in the stocks. Name of the game. Move the money from your client's pocket into your pocket. But if you can make your client's money at the same time, it's advantageous to everyone, correct? No. No one is paying attention. It's unbelievable. You have to act now. God, this is intimate. I feel like I'm financially inside of you or something. Okay. I have five houses. And a condo. I'm considering going long on April week. What do you think, Valentine? <laughs> <laughs> all right hi guys uh welcome back um so this is lesson six uh the last lesson lesson five we spoke a lot about brokers which i figured was a good place to ultimately go before you guys um eventually got into the meat of things but this is the lesson that i'm sure a lot of you have been wanting to do and you know this would be the whole highlight but today we're primarily going to get into the realm of technical analysis and um i'm going to show you how to do it there's a lot of ta stuff out there don't get me wrong um you know you just have to look around so much ta stuff however um what you're going to learn here you're not going to you're going to rarely see anywhere else. I'm not going to say you might not see it anywhere else because I don't know everything that's on the web, but you'll be hard pressed to find it in your typical places. Uh, you know, your maybe your baby pips or um, some other forum that you like to visit or maybe some other educator you like to listen to or on your favorite YouTubers. You're not going to see this stuff because this is the stuff that people keep very close to their chest. For the life of me, I can't think of why, because it's not like, you know, more advanced systems haven't been invented that could pretty much do the same thing. So why people are worried about letting other people know about this, it's beyond me, I don't really know. But anyway, that's not why we're here. <laughs> we're here so we can learn about Lesson 6 and we can learn about some of the things that we can take um, for the rest of our life, basically, when we think about trading and analysis. So let's, let's press on. So analyzing price, right? So we've spoken a lot about, you know, fundamentals, um, what to look for, how to get into a stock. Um, and we're going to focus primarily on stocks first, right? Some of this um, type of analysis will carry into other asset classes, but don't worry, I'm going to have a whole section for the other stuff. Everything from futures, option derivatives to, um, uh, uh, to uh, what's the word I'm searching for to cryptocurrency to so I'm going to have standalones right so we're covering stocks now we're going to cover forex we're going to cover futures we're going to cover options and we're going to cover crypto and of course they'll be overlapping because crypto has option derivatives as well so, and you know and we're not going to get into that that kind of kettle of fish just because obviously in the crypto space for example this is not very well done in my opinion anyway at the moment so it's just really a big gamble and people don't really understand the mechanics that underpin crypto derivatives so i'm not you're not gonna hear me talk about that stuff but we are going to get into um what's the word crypto as a property right so bitcoin we're going to talk about that and then we're going to also talk about security uh crypto as a security in terms of like you know ethereum altcoins and so on so so there will be a digital asset section because i think if you're going to be an asset manager you're going to be um, whatever you call it money manager trader uh swing trader day trader whatever you have to have a holistic picture of the market because they're going to be stuff like capital flows as well so a lot of new traders and don't worry guys we'll get into all this stuff right but a lot of new traders don't know that money flows from asset to asset so there is this general idea that you know a group of traders will just huddle around and just trade forex for example or they just huddle around into a market and just trade crude oil well if you're a solid manager right um and i think i've mentioned this before i want a podcast and i've interviewed some of the really some really great traders and you know what you get from them is that they don't focus on just one asset right they follow the, they follow the money so what you're going to find is sometimes the crude oil is up and other assets are going to be down, right? And that's what we call capital flow. So money's flowing out of one asset that is not yielding as much into something else that's yielding more. So understanding how these markets function 
it's going to be really crucial to your development. I don't care what anyone says. If they're going to tell me otherwise, they haven't traded long enough. Or, you know, if they're successful at it short term, they're probably just lucky. In the long term, they're probably going to burn out anyway. All right. So you need to know about all markets. So the approach here in this course or in this entire program that's going to last a while is going to be multi-asset. Right. So there's going to be a lot of focus on multi-asset because I don't want people walking away from this saying that, well, I didn't learn how to trade that. I don't know how that works. I definitely don't want that. So as a result, we're going to focus, we're going to have a broader spectrum. So a lot of what I'm going to teach you here today is probably going to carry through and, you know, um, you're not all going to learn it all here in one go. All right. So let's start with analyzing price. Now, that's how I see technical analysis. It's analyzing price. It's not nothing mystical. I mean, I've heard people and it's so, it, you know, it, it burns you and it's so ridiculous. And you hear very some influential personalities, whether you're listening to a famous podcast with certain individuals on there. I mean, people see technical analysis or price analysis as tea leaves. It's like ridiculous. I mean, how are you going to buy something if you don't know what it's historically cost? I mean, Okay, I know as a culture, we go into the supermarket and we see what things cost cost, and we go, okay, great, put it in my basket, right? Or we go into a store, they say this outfit costs this, put it back in my basket, right? So there's no historical pricing data on what an orange cost six months ago. Um, we intuitively feel the inflation in goods and services, but we don't, we don't internalize it. Right. In, in the in, in the stock market or in any kind of asset or derivative, people internalize price a lot. So we are almost always aware because there's this market from a perception point of view carries a lot of risk. It's you know, there's no risk in buying an orange for three dollars. Right. You know, because you're going to eat the orange and there is another kind of utility attached to the orange, which is you can consume it. You can't consume a stock, right? So you have to be more conscious of why you're buying it because of the, you know, it's value based, right? Like you need to have an end goal, an exit strategy. You don't need to exit an orange, right? So we sometimes look at what we do in our everyday life and equate it to the stock market. We can't do that, right? Because the stock market, you need to be very value aware. So Analyzing price is a crucial part of being able to understand why you're buying something or is it historically undervalued or overvalued. Now, if you don't do this, then I don't know what you're doing. So if you say, well, I'm just going to put my money in the S&P 500, no disrespect, guys, to people who do this. I mean, I think if you have 20 or 30 million and you just want to passively gain income from that, then the S&P grows, I think, on average about 7, um, well, 10% annually, right? Um, but you have to bear in mind that money deflates at 7% annually, right? No economist will tell you this. I will tell you this because I've run the numbers and, you know, I'm sure there are people out there who've done the same. So please do your own research on what is the actual year on year inflation. For those of you who live in the US on the dollar, I mean, on the pound, it's got to be higher, right? But for the dollar, on average, it's 10% annually. And if the S&P is growing 7% annually, then you're making net 3% and that's on a good year, right? So if you want to go and invest your money in the S&P 500 and you want to hawk on about compounding, you know, go ahead, do that. It's fine. Uh, if you've got 20, 30 million, it's probably going to work out for you. Um, you're going to have more millions. But to be honest, most people don't start from that. So that advice doesn't carry forward. And it's this is part of the reason why people don't take investing seriously. Because you listen to these people on you know, media and wherever, and they say, spout this stuff with so much confidence, they're brimming with it. And they're like, well, this is what I did. But then you've got to think, well, how old are you? First and foremost, how much did you have? And most of these guys are like personalities, TV personalities, financial advisor personalities on TV. They got millions and millions of dollars. They got massive TV rights. So to go to the everyday man and say, well, that's kind of what you should do at the age of 35, right? When you've got, a, you've got an intense mortgage, you've got maybe private school kids and, you know, for some anyway, or you're just basically, you know, you're trying to do something good for yourself and your family, whatever. To go tell that person, that, hey, you know what? You just go make friggin' <laughs> put your money in the S&P and just let it grow and compound it. Like, excuse me? <laughs> yeah, but anyway, each to his own, right? So for me, anyway, 
I think it is massively important that we have value perception. And the only way to do that is to uh, look at the historical pricing and see you know, how the asset is trading today relative to that. That is pretty much the singular definition for a technical analysis. You can make it as hocus pocus and as complicated as you like, but the bottom line is you're just trying to compare historical pricing with present pricing. You don't know what's going to happen on the right side of the chart. You can only make a deduction. And, you know, because history tends to repeat, it's cyclical. If like, you know, if you've read Neil Howe, for example, The Fourth Turning, really great book, recommended, um, you would understand that history is cyclical. So most things reoccur over and over again. And if that's the case, then if a stock was trading at a specific price, providing the fundamentals of the company remain relatively stable, then that stock should really go back to that price at some point. So that's all we're doing, right? That is the, the crux of it. But we're going to delve a little bit deeper into that. So let's think about volume or order flow. So these are the components that we need to consider, right? I don't care what anyone tells you. If you're not considering this, then you're just, you're, you're in you're in nowhere land, right? And you're, it's, it's going to be hell, hell to pay, assure you, if you're not looking at these things. So pay attention. So the first thing we want to look at is volume or order flow. So as part of an analysis framework, we need to understand how much of an asset is actually being exchanged, right? We need to know what the activity is. So think about it when you go to a market and, you know, you've got oranges and apples and everyone's, you know, it's an excited market and everyone's selling stuff, right? It's buzzing, right? So that's the kind of market. If you're a seller or you're an active trader in that market, you want to be in that market because it tells you that there are lots of customers there. It's a buzzy market and you're likely to sell something. But would you want to swap that um, environment to go stand on the side of the road on a corner street where one person walks down every hour? You're not going to sell anything. And it's and the, it's it's that um, volume that we're chasing. We want to see where people were are very very active and where things are going on, and we want to know how the the velocity of that exchange taking place in that market. You know what kind of sizes, what kind of money is changing hands. It's a it's a bit like if you're in a diamond market, for example, you might see people handing over twenty thousand dollars worth of cash to get something in return. But then if you go to, you know, just a basic flea market. You know, you're not going to see a lot of big exchange going on, right? So we want to gauge all of that. And the way to do that is to look at the volume and the order flow. Now I have, um, I'm not going to go into order flow on this particular course because that's an extensive topic by itself. But if you wanted to learn a lot more about order flow and a lot more in depth, more than what I'm going to teach you here, which is going to be largely what I like to describe as level one volume and how to analyze that. I'm not going to teach you how to analyze level two volume, which is the micro volume. It's the nano volume. And that's the volume that takes place every micro and nanosecond that you can see live on what we call a depth of market. I'm not going to get into that because I have a standalone program that you guys can check out. And I will try and leave links to these things um, on this course. Um, but I have a Discord server. So you probably might want to pop in there and ask me questions if you need to. But I'll try and leave links here. Um, I'm not sure how it affects the video, but I'll leave links so that you can see where I've got this course because I've got it on Udemy. So I've got a big extensive program of standalone stuff that it's impossible to cover here, but I can cover it more in a summary, but I can't really go very in depth because that would require, I'll be doing this for years, guys, basically. So I'll be literally collating this program for years in order to show you that extent of things. But at the end of the course, I'm going to be doing more stuff, right? So I'm going to be adding stuff and I'm going to be showing stuff. And it's just that it will be a lot easier for you to get there if you did some of the stuff. Like, Udemy is like stupidly cheap, right? Now, that all of this stuff is just charity, literally. Um, it's not going to make me a millionaire or anything. You know, but these courses, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to enter the billion dollar club, right? So it's, it's charity, right? So if you're going to, um, if you want to get there faster, then I would say look at the Udemy course specifically around volume and order flow. And I'll try and leave a link, um, you know, so you guys can check it out. Um, okay. Um, market profile is the next step, right? So market profile is a, a different framework of analysis, right? So um, for those of you guys who are not familiar, I go and Google Peter Stiedelmeier. Peter Stiedelmeier was the guy who, um, oh, I think it's called Stottlemyer. But anyway, um, I you know what's funny? I interviewed his partner, um, who helped him develop all of this. Um, 
Um, but uh, and again, story for another day. But um, yeah, Peter Stormeyer developed Market Profile. And Market Profile just allows you to put some statistical benchmarks in place because it takes what we call the bell curve theory in mathematics. And it takes the idea that 70% of a, um, 70 percent of a distribution is going to cost uh, about one standard deviation either side of the mean, right? So anything that is two, three standard deviations either side of the mean is more than likely going to be um, an outlier or what we what we would generally describe as an outlier, right? So it's very, very important to kind of have this information. And again, as we think about um, market profile, we think about it from a statistical perspective, so we can have some statistical benchmarks. But again, I've got an extensive program on Unimi that covers just market profile. I think I've got about eight, eight or so volumes over like two years. So again, if you want to go really in depth in market profile, um, that's how we're going to do it. But don't worry, when we get to the practical side of this lesson, I'm going to pretty much show you how you do it in a chart without needing this stuff yet. Right. So, it, it, you know, you might not need it, need it right now. The other thing we want to consider when we're analyzing price is time of day. Right. So time of day is important because certain times of the day, especially if you're an intraday trader. Now, of course, as you guys would know, I generally advocate a level of swing trade to position holding. I'm not a massive fan on intraday. I think there's a lot of churn there and the return you get tends to equal and what you get on the swing side. Now, if you're really good at intraday trading, you can separate maybe your um, brokerage accounts, one for intraday trading and one for um, swing trading. Now, also, if you don't have uh, $25,000, which is the benchmark for day trading because of the PDT rule in stocks, then you might end up trading something like futures. And again, personally, now it's personal opinion, I think stocks are more, um, they're more predisposed to, predisposed to day trading. So they're more palatable to day trading, in my opinion. Um, but again, some people would argue, and each to his own, like I said, I'm telling you what I know uh, after 15 years plus of, you know, being in market. So you, you can do what you want, ultimately. Um, time of day is important um, because some exchanges also open um, and close, right? So the, um, the, Grains, for example, they have opening and close times in futures. Um, options have opening and close times. Um, they because options don't trade pre market, for example. Stocks trade a lot pre market, but hardly anybody trades pre market. Um, I know a lot of brokers don't offer access to trade pre market as well, right? But pre market is also a place where you can trade, but you tend to find that the difference between the bid and the ask price, right? So the bid price is what um, the market will uh, essentially. If you're selling an asset, you're selling at the bid. So the market will buy from you at the bid. And of course, if you're buying an asset, you buy the offer and the market will sell to you the offer. So the difference between the bid and the ask or the bid and the offer is essentially what we call a spread, right? So that's supposed to be broker, broker, broker profit. Um, obviously, some people argue right now that brokers make profits in many other ways and the spread is just an inconvenience. But Essentially, that the difference between bid and offer is where the, um, if in the stock market, of course, which is exchange based, it's where th that's the cheapest price someone is willing to sell at, and the offer is the cheapest, um, the offer is the cheapest price someone's willing to sell at, or the most expensive price, i.e., and then the bid is the cheapest price someone is willing to buy at. So, um, the bids, the difference between the two, obviously, is kind of that middleman profit. If that makes sense. So just to explain bid and offer, because I realized that that's one thing I didn't actually include, but it's a really simple uh, concept that, you know, if you want to buy something, you buy at the asking price. Someone is asking it, so you buy it. Uh, if you want to sell something, you sell at the bid price. Someone is willing to go to the bid in order to buy that asset at the bid. So it's not actually a very terrible concept, on, uh, terribly difficult concept to understand. So sometimes a day are highly liquid, like the US Open, for example. So if you're a Forex trader, well, you, you know, you don't really want to be trading excessively in Asia, say for Euro dollar. It's going to be low liquidity because most of the traders are going to be in Europe and the US. And generally that's when, you know, banking and money is going to flow. So it's not, you know, time of day is going to be important. Um, also, events happen at time of day. So certain things go on 
and that creates liquidity or draws interest like certain data points get released i mean everyone has heard about if you're a forex trader you know about non-farm payrolls draws in a lot of liquidity um again if you're in the stock market earnings season so and also at certain you know post-market earnings pre-market earnings uh, releases always tend to generate a lot of volatility so again time of day is important liquidity right so we have to have a concept of liquidity now modern algorithm algorithms are drawn to areas of liquidity so human behavior itself stays static so when they program those algorithms they kind of just do what um, people have programmed them to do Right, but a lot of these algorithms are also market making algorithms, right? So if we think about firms like Citadel, um, Virtue, these are all high frequency trading organizations that basically provide liquidity to the market, right? So in effect, what these algorithms do is they get drawn to areas of liquidity. So if there is, um, if there are a lot of orders clustered in a spot, that's liquidity. The, mar the algorithms would offer prices higher right till they hit that liquidity and then everything gets filled and you get that trade information or trade data in your say for example your time of sales window so it tells you well 5000 shares were traded at this price right so there of course we intuitively we say well it's the demand and supply that is causing price to go up and down but in modern markets right, it's all a black box now you it's all proprietary right and there's and again if you don't believe me there's a really really good book on this called flash boys I believe it was written by michael lewis and it really goes into detail on how this high frequency trade in black box was invented and the person the people who invented it and it centers also around a character or an individual who's a real person who i believe i'm not too sure don't quote me on this but i think he's still in jail by the fbi because apparently he stole the one of these kind of proprietary algorithms from goldman sachs and attempt to deploy it at another high frequency trading firm he was employed at and these guys were getting millions and millions of dollars in order to put all this stuff together right um he was a russian guy but um um you know not that that's relevant lots of people obviously <laughs> can develop algorithms but the earliest algorithms that sort of came in the russians were very big on it due to their their very strong polytechnic sector um, obviously, this has been the case since communist Russia or uh, the Soviet Union, where everyone did a lot of polytechnic stuff. So they're highly technical people. So obviously, when this new sort of programming market sparked off in finance, these guys were at the front end of it, basically. Um, and a lot of them couldn't even speak English, but they could definitely code, right? And so obviously, everyone bought into it. And, you know, it's a really interesting book. I would employ everyone to read it. Flash Boys is a fascinating story on how, H how HFT came to dominate. But, but so it, you have to be, you have to be absolutely stupid to believe that, you know, that actual demand drives price. What you have to probably bear in mind is that if there's a lot of liquidity, so let's say, for example, a lot of people have put buy limits at a certain price then the algorithms are going to go out and search those orders. And a, another really good example is Navinda Singh Sarao's story, who was um, also, um, and who, uh, I think the guy, Liam Vaughan, wrote a really good book on this guy's life, right? So it's kind of like a memoir or something. And it really talks about how he got into trading and how he built an algorithm that essentially he was blamed for the flash crash in 2010, I believe it was. So this guy was blamed for breaking the entire financial system at one point and obviously ended up in on FBI custody. And he, he's a, he's like a, he's a, he's a London boy, right? So for someone obviously who, um, you know, was born in London, grew up in London, um, you know, I, I kind of, I, you know, his story really resonated with me because I remember, you know, I remember the firm he was with, Futex, um, you know, um, you know, and it's, it's just like, it's like a quintessential London trader story, but it's a really, really good, um, story and everyone should read it because it also will give you insight into the fact that you're deluded if you think that this market is driven by demand and supply in that way, right? So essentially prices get offered higher and whatever liquidity is sitting there would get filled and they, it might get spooled lower. So being able to understand how liquidity itself is distributed across the entire historical price spectrum, because that's really what we're looking at. Prices historically 
no one knows what's going to happen on the right side of the chart. So we're looking at the left side all the time and we need to see how liquidity was distributed and what the algorithms did at specific points. So these are the things I'm going to show you. Right, that's why I said no one's going to tell you this stuff. Let's just forget about it. Right? Unless you're paying 10 grand or 20 grand to sit in, in an office with a guy who's probably not even going to tell you this anyway. Um, but the reality is that liquidity is distributed and you kind of want to understand how all of that kind of factors in. Now let's talk about order types. Um, so we have different order types and I'm going to approach these because again, I realized that this is not something I covered a lot earlier. And um, because again, if you're new to markets, if you first time you ever seen the market, right, you would have obviously seen the introduction lesson one, two, three. So now we're at a stage where, you know, we're, we're less than six, right? So um, it's an important point now for you to start understanding order types, right? How do I, you know, what's execution like? So we have market orders. Okay, so this market order is just a simple order where we just click the buy button. It's the worst kind of order, right? So if you're making a market order in any market, it's the worst kind of order because you can get filled at any price, you can get slipped. It's just crazy. And it's amazing how many people still click the button to buy something. You see the people on the Robin Hood hat just hit buy by market, right? The best kind of order today is and remember there are other order types that can be programmed in it's part of what high frequency traders do but we're not going to talk about those we're going to talk so specifically about the ones that you are going to encounter 99 percent of the time so we have um limit orders so limit orders are orders that you put to be executed at a specific price which it could be either be below the market which will make it a buy limit order or it could be above the market which will make it a sell limit order so basically you're saying you're given a specific instruction to say that i want to buy at this price limit i don't want to go left or right at this i want to buy at this price limit or nothing right so that's a limit order and then we have what we call a stop order. Stop orders can take different forms, okay? But we're going to talk about the most common stop order, which is either to get us in. So if we're trying to buy something, for example, to get us in at a price above the market at a future date. So let's say, for example, the stock is trading at $20. We say we only want to buy it if it goes to $21. We can set a buy stop order, which will fill us into that trade at $21. And hopefully the share goes to $25, $26, 27 28 You get the picture. And then we have, this could either be a sell stop order as well, which means that we want to give an order to sell at a given price and obviously below the market. And if that price is achieved, let's say $21, um, the market's trading that now, and then we put a sell stop order at $19. Now, of course, there is a variation in this, right? So we can put what we call a stop loss order or a buy stop loss order in the case where we're short the market or we're selling. So if we're selling something or we short something at $20, we can put a buy stop order at $21, right? So a buy stop loss order, so it's $21, which is essentially, if the market goes to 21, we wanna be stopped out of it. Basically, I want you to get me out of this trade. So what the, what the broker will do is, they will execute a order to buy your short position back, right? So essentially, you're getting out at a loss of one point right so 20 21 um one point vice versa of course if you're in a buy position you'd put a sell stop order right and there's another order type called a stop and limit order or stop limit right so again a stop limit is just a combination between a stop and a limit so effectively let's say that you wanted to get filled um you wanted to be filled into a trade at a limit order so but you're saying well market's trading at $20 if it goes to 15 and it trades through that I want you to put a limit order in place let's say for 15 right so essentially the market trades 15 it triggers the limit order so it goes 15 so the stop side is it goes through 15 it triggers a limit order in and then if it trades 15 again it stops you out. it stops you out of 15 so it's another different type of order, right? So usually this is kind of we, um, brokers that don't have stop orders. I, I see stop limits a lot more common in the crypto market, but they do exist in all the others. But people tend to use stop limits to reduce slippage, basically. But um, to be honest, 
each to his own. Um, most of the time, a stop order is adequate, but in high moving markets where you could blow through that stop, um, stop you know, get filled at a poor price, what tends to happen is that your limit will get triggered and then you get filled at the limit if there's a lot of volatility. The bad news is, of course, that it may not get filled because once that stop limit is triggered, um, you know, it might still keep going down. And if it doesn't come back to the limit, then you're not going to get filled. So it's good and bad, right? But for most markets, you're going to counter limit orders, market orders, and stop orders, right? And then, of course, stop limit, but those are not so common. Okay, so why is any of this necessary? Right, so essentially, why does any of this make sense? So if we think about it all, we're in this to make money. So it's important to know that as an investor, you're willing to pay the least for something and that gives you the sense that you're going to do potential payoff, right? So this is necessary. This is the reason why we have to look at TA. We have to look at price. I mean, it's absolutely necessary. Can't stress it enough. It's because, I mean, where did they make money? <laughs> if I can't come in as an investor and I'm willing to, I'm willing to pay stupid prices for things, like, you know, I come in and I just, I just don't care. Then I'm, I'm a pig not an investor i'm just someone who's come to the slaughter i mean a good example was what happened in the crypto market i mean people were paying seventy thousand dollars for bitcoin coming into a federal reserve meeting that was going to raise interest rates i mean I, I just don't get the logic i mean why would you pay seven? but again like i said that's why this course exists because it's just lack of knowledge can you imagine there were a thousand millions of people making these decisions right it's insane but it's happening happening because there's not enough education out there if the education out there was good and decent do you think this will happen to people if you think that people teaching people out there now if they're doing what i'm doing for you now for free if they were doing it in their paid programs i don't care if they're million dollar traders they got two million followers on youtube whatever if they were doing this to benefit their audience do you honestly think that i would be making a program like this today or do you think as many people who fail in investing would fail? The answer to the question is no, that wouldn't be the case. But most of these people, they're not doing any of this. And then they're just literally profiting off their clients or getting money from YouTube. And that's that's their curve, right? Because they, they can't be bothered to, um, you know, talk about this stuff with their audience. And no offense you know, I'm sure these people, some of them are well-meaning, just just mis misguided. Now, again, it's not enough to just hold or huddle, as they say. So again, we've heard about these stories, people holding assets till they go to zero. I mean, there was this really um, high potential social media platform that was, I think it's called StockTwits, right? And you would, n you would never be short of seeing people on StockTwits you know, saying I'm holding a really, a real bagger, right? Something that's, you know, it's going to get, go to zero, right? So I'm holding it because I believe it's going to come back. There's no shortage of that. And it's really sad. But, but again, it's not enough just to huddle, right? So you need to know about price historically, value. You need to understand this and that's why we need to do TA. Now, technical analysis, um, TA. Now, we are more likely to outperform the market. There is this, you know, that's why in the beginning of this program, I showed you my, 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 my curve, right? That is my PL curve. <laughs> um, and if I can make 40% annually, and I'm going to make more, right? So this is what it is today, but I can definitely tell you, and you guys who follow my Discord can already see that based on other positioning that I've done, I'm probably going to make more. Now, if I can do that, then the average, do you know what the average fund manager makes annually? Now, granted, everyone's going to argue on the AUM point, blah, 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 but you don't know how much AUM I have, right? Um, and yes, it's not going to be more than Paul Tudor Jones, whatever, right? You know, but the reality is the average fund manager, and I'm not talking about those guys, the celebrity names in this business. I'm talking about the average guy makes 5% annually. In fact, 
I think, uh, and let me get this right. There have been some stats out that this latest bull rally, hedge funds lost $46 billion on short positions within the space of a week, right? $46 billion, right? And that's basically, it's going to impact their overall return. Right. So if you think about that for a second, so the average fund manager can only p- produce five, six percent at best in some. That's the average in the industry, guys. So the fact of the matter is that you can do better because you have more flexibility of allocation for one, because obviously if you have smaller funds, you're more nimble growth. It can stifle return. A lot of people don't know this. They think, well, you know, if you make you have more money, then it's all good. But no, not necessarily. It stifles return. If you have less money, you can really generate some really good alpha. But you can't do that if you can't get stocks at a good price. So take, for example, Tesla. $20 at one point Tesla was trading at. If you're owner of Tesla at $20, I mean, think about it, right? Remember, Tesla's gone through a stock split. Um, you know, could, <laughs> so think about how much money you'd be sitting on with Tesla. If you'd done the TA to get it $20 and you'd held it, for the you know the time span we're talking about i think it, i think a lot of this was going on and we'll look at some charts at some point but i think we're talking here 2016 2017 this stuff was really cheap right um you know i remember at one point um uh if you wanted to buy a call option on nio um which was the electric car company in china it was two dollars fifty right it was, it was that was the premium um I mean, I can come up with so many of these. Um, AMD, um, for those guys who've been in my Discord, this will, this will really be the one. Um, when I was calling out AMD from $2.50 as a potential to go to $50, and I was saying, people, you've got to own this, you've got to own this, right? So, you know, there is that, you know, there's that ebb and flow, right? And you, you, you need to be able to see where's value. And if you don't do that, you can't outperform the market. So you're not likely to do that. So these are the reasons why we need to do TA. It makes sense. If someone goes and tells you that I just do fundamental analysis, TAs, tea leaves, and I don't read this, this is that, it's hocus pocus retail trader. If someone's out there telling you that, just, just put like some cotton wool in your ears, give them the finger and then just walk off. If I mean, if they're your friend, you can be like, yeah, just give them a hug and say, so I don't worry about it. Um, yeah, yes. Yeah, you're right. You're right. There's not even, you don't argue because this person lacks the basic knowledge. And if, you know, and I'm sure if they're benefiting in any way from the market, it's not going to last or it's, it's like a scam. It's kind of like a Bernie Madoff situation, right? There's, cause there's so many stock promoters out there and none of them would want you to look at a chart. So, um, story for another day. Right, so we're going to go step by step in terms of how to analyze price, right? So I'm going to give you set instructions that you can follow and that you can go away and do that. And that can even be homework, but we're going to go through that step by step. But meanwhile, before we jump into that, you guys probably need a coffee break. So I'd say get up from the screen, go get a coffee and then come back and we'll take it from there. Whoops, hold on, uh, guys, sorry. Some technical difficulty, whoops, there we go. All right, awesome stuff. So hopefully you guys grabbed a coffee um, and uh, you're now relaxed. I've just made myself a glass of yerba mate, um, yerba mate tea, which I absolutely love. Um, really really helps with like concentration and it's just you're just happy all the time right it's pretty pretty cool tea leaf it's just a little bit like green tea but i think it's a little bit more flavorful so some nice yerba mate will do me uh, it's very famous in latin america you know, if you've ever been um the paraguayans call it terere um i think uh mate is what it's called in argentina um, but yeah, uh, it's awesome drink. <laughs> uh, I don't know how I strayed into a conversation about Yuba Mate, but anyway, off topic, right back to the matter at hand, right? So how to analyze price? 
I'm going to take you guys through this step by step because I think that this is something that is not really looked at. How do we do it? Like most people come, of course, there's always going to be a technical analysis. Like, I, you know, I'm going to show you how to do this kind of TA, that kind of TA. But for most people, they end up just bouncing from strategy to strategy or technical strategy to technical strategy because they keep getting all this package stuff, right? Because everyone wants to turn their latest TA class into a packaged product that apparently is easy to understand. So that leads to a lot of, in my opinion anyway, a lot of unnecessary specialization. It's one of the reasons why in the beginning, a few lessons earlier, I said, well, I'm not going to get into order flow, right? Because I've got a package thing on order flow. It's just the nature of how our society works. It's all about consumption, right? So you have to be able to make it consumer friendly, right? A lot of you are not even going to sit through this video. I'm like, I'm, I'm like 40 minutes into this lesson. I'm sure half of you have left. Um, you know, the good news about putting this on YouTube is that I can see the metrics. So again, you know, yeah, for the people who are going to be lucky to find this and the people who know that I'm doing this, well, amazing guys, <laughs> your life's going to change. But some people are never really going to ever find this because that's the problem that we generally have with the way things get um, put together. Like, you know, it's more of a, uh, it's more of a consumption problem in my opinion, right? So getting things, you know, put in a, in a kind of methodology that is kind of absolute, people don't like the idea. So it, it leads to all these little camps of, I trade this, I am a demand and supply trader, I am this kind of trader. Some of them are even in cult of personality type of traders, right? You just have to look around. You don't necessarily need to take my word for it. You just literally have to look around on the web and you'll be able to see a lot of stuff. So step one, start looking at price behavior on the highest time frame, which is the monthly chart. Take a top down approach, right? So that, that's pretty much standard, right? So if you're going to look at any asset class, you want to start from the monthly. And I'm going to show you proof as to why you need to start there. So again, a lot of people will put things out there, but they don't show proof. I'm going to show you proof as to why you should start there, why it will feel logical and it will be in a, in, in, there'll be a method to it. So step one, start with a top-down approach. You need to see a monthly chart and I'll show you what to look for. Step two, look for the obvious. Measure every price up and down. So essentially every price swing up and down to create a historical pullback and an extension average. What do I mean by that? Right. So let's say... Apple stock has been going up for the past three years and then it has this pullback, right? And it's like, let's say it's a 40% pullback. So it pulls back 40% and then continues again and goes and goes and goes for another three years and then pulls back again, an average of about 40%. Now you want to take note of those pullbacks over the years, right? Because they're giving you a sense of the historical volatility of Apple when it pulls, when, you know, when we do get those dips. So essentially, where is the best value? Right? It's really simple, right? Where's the best value? It's, well, it's when it dips 40%. That's the best possible price. So if you, if you see a 30, 35% dip in Apple, then you know, you know, you're kind of close to what that bottom is. You know, it's a good buy at that stage, considering, of course, the fundamentals we discussed in earlier lessons are still in place. Apple's profitable, for example, and all that stuff is still going on then it makes sense to, at that stage, consider Apple as a buyer on a 40% pullback. And you'll be able to see this historically, and that's the benefit of being able to look at the left side of the chart. You're looking at historical price action, which is giving you an idea of what could potentially take place in the future. And then we also want to look at the average extension. So how much, how far did it go over three years? And that also gives you a sense of what might be going on with the stock. So let's say, for example, the company has been diluting shares. You would see every year the company, the, the, the extensions are getting tighter and tighter. So maybe this year, maybe over the past two years, it extended 100%. But then the next, after we get a dip, we get the next extension. And it's been like, it's extending like, I know, 60%. So you can see with every dip, the extension is getting tighter and tighter. And that could reflect that the company's been diluted. 
and it's not going to it's not going to have the value that you perceive down the line it could be lack of interest right maybe a lot of people may maybe there's all the money that can flow into it has flowed into it and the only thing left now is for it to go back down again right so you will start to see that develop and so measure the average extensions and you can also do some other educated stuff like compare it to the money supply that's a good way to you know measure asset inflation so stuff like that you can do again this gives you directional bias right especially if you're looking at individual names in stocks and this is true not just for stocks it's true for any asset that appreciates over time right so generally is limited in supply which was one of our fundamental metrics that you need to consider um, in previous lessons is that is it limited in supply and if it is you should generally see it growing but if it's not growing and then you know or it's declining then there's something fundamentally wrong with the value perception of the company it's important to have a directional bias step 3 move one time frame lower to the weekly to check for liquidity bias now the weekly time frame in stocks feels like the optimal execution time frame now why do i say this now if you go down one time frame you're looking for liquidity right so effectively that's where we're going to see any kind of excessive liquidity so remember we spoke about and uh, where stops are going to be positioned for example and and i'm going to show you on a chart so i just want you to get these steps all right so that's where you're going to search, search for liquidity right so you want to see where those where the market's grabbed liquidity in large amounts right and the best place to look for that if you're trading in stocks this will be different for maybe futures or it could be different for forex but if you're trading in stocks based on the overall liquidity in stocks you want to focus on the weekly time frame for your optimum time frame and that makes it an ideal time frame to execute into a trade because it's not a long long time frame but it's also not a short short time frame and it's the time frame that has your understanding of liquidity step 4 go one time frame lower to the daily to access any kind of excessive float rotation now this is an important factor when considering the right time to buy so the weekly chart will tell you that this stock is probably going up now right so especially if you're long only or you're long and you want to look for somewhere to cover or you want to look for where the next pullback is going to be so you can sort of dollar cost average depending on how you're sort of allocated right so if you go one time frame down to the daily you will start to see where there's excessive float rotation i'm going to show you what float float rotation is now this will tell you that this is the moment to buy this is where my risk is likely to be so this is when i need to maybe change my decision if i need to um but again if you followed the fundamental steps i show you you should really need to change your decision on a good buy right now we're talking here about long only the people who need to turn tail a lot are people who are going to go short and what i've said in this program is i'm not going to promote the idea of going short right there's just some the stuff that i wouldn't do or i think is too risky I would show you to do that. And if you're thinking about you know doing that kind of short trade, I'll show you how to do it using derivatives. I you're honestly speaking, it's just something that I'd advise you guys to stay away from if you can, especially when you you know you're looking at really good companies, solid fundamentals. I mean, I just told you this you know on this latest bull rally this month, hedge funds lost 46 billion. What do you think they lost it on? It's shorting, right? So you can't, you know, if you're holding some of these things, I mean if you're holding Intel, for example, and go back and look at a chart of Intel, do you think you'd ever lost money? Would you have ever needed to worry about closing out a trade? No. And you've probably at this point made a 100% return in the space of a couple of months on Intel. Just go back and look at an Intel chart. The ticker's INTC. So don't take my word for it. Just go back, have a look and see for yourself. Okay. Let's grind some examples so step one and two for an example so just just as a reminder let's skip back to step one and two so step one and two was start looking at price behavior on the highest time frame the monthly step two is try and measure the average extensions and swings so that's what we're going to do in these examples so here you're looking at amd and um, so we spoke about that um, so you can see actually going all the way back to 2016 look where the price was it's way down here Right, so if we wanted to 
sort of build a picture of what AMD has done over this time. So we're talking here from 2016 or you know 2016 to today, which is 2024, or you know, you know, you're getting the picture, right? We're looking at a couple of years, right? A couple of years at worth of price action, more than a decade. I don't remember those days. It's it's really weird. A decade is gone. Um, you know. Um, you know, I'm looking at it now and thinking, oh my God, it's almost a decade. Like, you know, um, it's not quite a decade, it's eight years, but still it's getting close, right? It's a decade. Um, you know, eight years has gone by. But anyway, um, because I remember the reason I'm saying this, I remember doing the analysis on AMD when it was two dollars fifty. And I was saying to you guys, it was probably around about sort of 20, 2015, 2016, right? And um, yeah, look where it is today. It's insane. Um, and yes, I did own some AMD. I haven't held it till now, um, but I did own some AMD and I did pretty well on AMD, but that's beside the point. But anyway, let's, let's move on. Uh, so we can see here that we got a 42% uh, correction between somewhere between 2017 and 2018. Um, I, I think a lot of this was influenced by the interest rate hikes that Janet Yellen had embarked on around about this sort of period, which I believe it was 2017, 2018. And then we had a 53% drop um, sort of mid-2018. So I think this was the Yellen stuff. And then we moved up 925%. So this was a 9x move between that dip in 2018 towards the end of 2019 uh, or towards the beginning of 2019, my bad. And that took us all the way to the end of 2021. So it's not long, right? We did a 9x return on AMD. And of course, there were fundamental cases. The company was making money. There was a shortage of uh, uh, um, silicon chips. So there, we, there was a shortage of microchips in general, right? So that industry is still experiencing a shortage. And also, we can see that, the, you know, AMD was one of those companies that was going to benefit the most because they're already big, established, and so on, and they're already profitable. Uh, you can see that here already from the net income, um, you know, that it, they were quite profitable. So again, um, we can see that was a 9x extension. Now we can see prior to that from, from the dip before we got the next one, that was a 2x extension. So on average, we can clearly see over time the kind of dips we get in AMD. So we can start to discern where value is. Now let's bring that sort of analysis onto the latest dip, which was um, the Federal Reserve's um, monetary tightening um, policy that started towards the end of 2021. So we can see that through most of 2022, up until um, close to the end of it, AMD was declining because everyone was selling stock, um, whether they were founders, executives, they were all selling stock, right? Because it was the, the market was well overpriced coming into a rate hike. Best chance to lure people into buying the top of the market. It was the best chance for the market to correct and give people the opportunity to buy at cheaper prices. Sorry guys, I need to sit my ear for Marty, it's getting cold. Um, yeah, so when you think about it, you can start to see that as soon as we were sort of between 40 and 50%, AMD was value. So you could have been buying this from about 74 bucks. Um, you would have had roughly about 58 bucks on AMD. Today it's trading pre-market 122, well pre-market as of taking this shot, it was 122.55, right? And we can clearly see if we took the upswings, right? So the historical upswings, right? So this is what we call like a um, trading. We has this really cool feature where we can sort of ghost a bar or create a ghost bar um, that represents a prior cycle move, right? So here you can see we had a bar that took into account a historical cycle move, uh, which I believe is this one here, or it's this one here. I can't, be, can't remember. Let me have a look actually. See which one it is. Should be able to tell. Yeah, okay, so it's from a historical one, so it's not visible on this chart. But basically what I've done is I've created two cycles from the one that was um, into 2016, 2017. And I've also looked at this cycle here, which is when the last time we got a 67% drop was back at that cycle. And then now we had a 53% and then we had a 42%. So I've looked at both. I looked at potentially where AMD could go um, as we sort of grind into 2020, um, 2024, 
So you can see that we're somewhere behind where we should have been with this price. So there was a bit of a gap here, but then we can see it catching up, but it's more in line with the cycle pre 2017. Right, and that's what we're seeing here. I believe that's the one we're seeing here. Oh, it could be my bad. It could actually be this one, 2018. So yes, it's exactly this cycle. So I'm just seeing the patterning now. So it is a little bit more remis reminiscent to what we saw here, right? So the pricing is a little bit more lockstep. So if you were using this as a benchmark, you could already start to project where we would be today. Because if you look, we're trading 122.55 pre-market. That is exactly what we would have traded close to at this point in the cycle. You can, it's almost exactly picture perfect, right? Literally picture to the bar. So this doesn't always happen. So I'll take, I'll make the assumption that following that same cycle, this is what it should look. So we should probably take a bit of a pause at 174, back up and then continue eventually topping out somewhere between sort of 270 and let's make room for error to 220. So it gives us a pretty decent valuation at this point that we have a long bias for 220 on AMD. It's currently trading at 122. Now it's just under 100% return. So it makes it, okay, it's it's a good value here. But if you are buyer at 58 and you are following this cycle, then you've seen the dip, you've seen the pop, then you've got more confidence to hold, right? Um, and that's why we developed that monthly buy. So this is proof as to why you want to look at a top down approach. This is definitive proof, guys. Right? If you, I mean, again, I'm going to show you more, right? But that's an example. So you, again, you can see that even though this cycle here, which was a 2018, 2019, didn't really play out, we were behind that. It was very obvious that we were going to be doing that cycle from, you know, pretty much mid 2023. This would have been the one that you'd be looking at anyway. So, Again, that was an example. Let's do another one. So this is Qualcomm. All right, so typically Qualcomm has 50, 48%, 47% dips. Typically, right, the big ones. This is where the most value has always been. Um, again, you can see over the time frame, this is a monthly chart of Qualcomm. So we just had a 47% dip, right, and then we're rallying on Qualcomm. So if we're looking at where we are, well, it could be either cycle because we're almost exactly where we should be. Um, you know, we're not quite exactly um, because we're slightly behind by some 155, uh, you know, so by some 30 points. So again, we do expect that at some point we might catch up with this and start to track this cycle a little bit more. As you can see, the cycles have been choppy, so we know that Qualcomm won't be clean. Um, to the upside, but we can definitely look at 264 at the minimum to 410 at the maximum, depending on the fundamental performance, most likely of Qualcomm would look at that. So, but we know on average, we've got a 3X here. We got close to a 2X here over the two cycles. So again, if this holds true, looking at this cycle, which is what we looked at, and this cycle, which is the closest, this is kind of what we're looking at, right? So Doing that cyclical analysis on a month gives us a bullish bias because we've dropped 47%. The chances that we're going to go lower is actually highly reduced. And there are other factors as well that I'll show you when we get to float rotation that will cement this point for you. So again, that's another step one to step two example. We measured the pullbacks. We measured the upswings. So we know potential gain. And now we're looking at cycle repeat options, right? 264, 410, and that looks very valid as a potential now of course if we start to lag behind it considerably that also creates an alertness that oh something's wrong we're not following historical cycles what's going on with qualcomm is there something changing in the fundamentals is the company doing something in the background that we need to know about and all of that will come to to light again let's look at another example example one and two um this is qualcomm um, looking at it historically, right? So how did this, so let's say we were following a cycle repeat, looking at historical cycles. So here we can see 3rd of November, 2008 and 2016, right? So let's say we were making a projection from 2008, where was Qualcomm going to go historically? 
And we've taken the historical cycles available to us. And that's what we've come up with, that we had a target of somewhere between 87 and 111 um, in the future. Now you can see that Qualcomm started and then we had this big dip and then we were sort of behind. So that tells you immediately that we're probably not going to get this. Right? We can see where the big turning points are. So we kind of want to look at that as where we're going to get to because we can see we started fine. We dipped off and then we were lagging by some, where are we? Um, it's, it, we were lagging by some 50 points by, because of this dip. So that immediately alerts you as a, an investor that, okay, there's something wrong with the stock. Maybe I should uh, diversify into something else to kind of hedge this, keep a closer eye. Let's just see what Qualcomm would do. Look at the numbers. And as we kept growing into 2012, it became evident that, okay, we're probably going to break the highs, which typically is what happens, but we're maybe not going to get to 8,711. It's taken a lot longer to do that. So we can look at this 87 as the top. And then we traded about 80 and then we started to show weakness. I mean, you're not going to hold on for seven points. Um, again, we did have a major top. And when we look at the weekly, we'll talk about liquidity. So all of that would have limited the gain to at least 111. But think about it, guys. If you'd held on, you're with 127 now, right? So if you kept it over years, you'd still get your price. But over the, the time frame that you're looking at for your portfolio, you probably would have decided that this was one that you didn't want to keep. Or if you were going to keep it, you'd be well aware that we were lagging. But I thought I'd show you an example where things are not, not going picture perfect. And the only way to do that was to look at if you'd done the same cycle repeat analysis um, uh, historically. All right, so let's take another example. Step one, two example as well uh, on the monthly. This is a company called Ansys, right? So Ansys Inc. So again, you can see quite similarly, What's going on here? So again, you can track this company back historically, 30, uh, 63% dip, 20%, 28%, 34%, 50%. A little bit less predictable on the dips, but generally we can see that we've had some good progression to the upside. So again, we want to look at the different cycles and then we want to put them over the different dip frames. So what's this telling us? I mean, if we look at, for example, this cycle, we are pretty much behind, quite a few points behind where we should be. So again, that gives us an alertness that if we break the highs, then there's a good chance. Where, where did we last pause? That was about sort of just above 415, right? So we expect that this stock is going to at least take us above 415 as a minimum requirement. Now, because we know historically we tend to grow further, it's a very low float company. So there's a chance that for me, 694 would be where I'll peg it as a top. It will take a lot longer to do that than this projection because we can see that. But largely, I think if we can get to about 600, it will be a seller for me, right? And then you want to close out just in case. But at the max, if this thing somehow has a big push to the upside, then we're looking at 1400 a share. And don't, before you tell me that's not possible, look at Chipotle. Um, so nobody tell me that it's not possible, right? The, these low float companies can easily do that. And most people are not even looking at them. They're not even paying attention to them. Um, again, more proof. I'm going to take you away from the stock world into Bitcoin. Bitcoin, typically 85% dips. And we get 16x here. Um, this was a huge one, early adoption. You know, this was, we're looking at 109x, right? Which is why we created so many Bitcoin millionaires and billionaires. Because you didn't need to invest a lot of money to really cash in in the 2018 cycle or 2017 cycle. And then you can clearly see that we went into the next halving and we did 16x. More people knew about it. So adoption was a little bit tougher. We couldn't really push it up. Um, you know, that's just the story with Bitcoin. We're down to 77% and we started rally to the upside. Now, if you look at where we are, we're following the 20, 2015 cycle, right? So we lockstep with it. So if you look at the blue, section, you can see that we're almost exactly where we were pound for pound in this cycle, right? So you can see here that the last cycle, we'd already had a major dip, but in this cycle, we didn't get that. So there's an expectation we could get a dip, but then again, we might not. So if you're holding Bitcoin, rather than wait for that dip, you might as well just keep holding it and, you know, have a point where you don't need to average anymore. Because for me, past 50K, it's no point. But if we, if we're right, Right, and this is probably what has brought a lot of speculation 
from commentators that Bitcoin could do a million. And the reason why people have probably looked at it that way is because if you think about it, we could go to a million. This is a logarithmic scale, right? So it's really factoring in the move. I mean, look how fast we've come from where we were, which was just about 15,000 a Bitcoin. And today we're trading at thirty-seven, nearly 38,000 a Bitcoin. Right, so again, you can see that repeat there. And for me, at the least, we should be sitting around 220K a Bitcoin. Now, what are the fundamentals surrounding Bitcoin? Low float, 21 million Bitcoin, um, 18 million in circulation, 15, 15 million in actual Bitcoin in circulation. The rest are lost, right? So the reality of the scenario is <laughs> it's what it is. Supply is really tight. We're expecting an ETF, which could draw in this big dip just in case we're behind or it could cause the market to explode. Um, you know, no way of telling at this point. I think, I'll, you know, I don't know, maybe a lot of people, a lot of people would need Bitcoin, right? So fundamentally, it's quite sound. Uh, we're launching an ETF. Someone needs to hold physical Bitcoin to support the ETF. So that will lead to a lot of buying. I believe we haven't seen in the market because a lot of the buying would be backdoor, right? So they'll be going directly to other counterparties to access Bitcoin. Right. So they can reduce the market impact. But eventually there will be a supply squeeze. Right. So again, when we think about that, you, you can actually see it. And again, this takes you all back, guys, to the fundamentals we've been talking about. Limited in supply, supply squeezes. Right. So again, we can see that. Right. So again, worst case scenario, we get about 200 coin. Right. That's my expectations. And we might pause at 220 back up. But this is my expectation. Right. And because we've seen the there's been a decline with each Bitcoin cycle. Then I'm putting it at 13x, right? And maybe I'm being generous, right? Or maybe we might just get stuck again at 100k Bitcoin, right? Which will be a different cycle. But if we're looking at historical cycle repeats, now if we were looking at this one versus this one, then this would have been a really short cycle, right? So we would have been way off. But now that we have a short cycle, we can perceive what that's like, then maybe this is what we ought to be looking at. And if we end up with a much shorter cycle than we've seen historically, at a time when Bitcoin is a, is going to probably have its biggest adoption yet, then it will tell you something sinister about Bitcoin. It will say something is going on because that supply squeeze is not being recognized. There's a there's a manipulation aspect here with the price that we just can't figure out, right? And it will bring more questions, but we haven't seen that yet. So it's very interesting to see how this cycle would react versus historical cycles and i think a lot of people are looking at that so again here's another definitive proof that the looking for value right historical pricing information is important when making current decisions because if you had looked at these 84 85 percent dips then you would know that under 20k was premium for bitcoin so you would at least be buying and then when you start to see these big rallies right when if you look at historical cycles once we'd rallied a little bit there was no going back you would immediately know the bear market is over. So even though it was a shorter cycle, the rise above 20K and the hold at about 25 would have told you that you want to be putting more money in Bitcoin, right? Now, guys, think about this. If you didn't know anything about this, right? Let's say you were completely dumb about Bitcoin. How would you know to move money from the equity market in front run, which was, I mean, Bitcoin delivered year to date more than 100, 100%. Right. So so again, just an just a capital flow out from something in the Bitcoin could have made your management year. Reality. OK, so let's take a step back. So now we're going to look at a step three example. So in a step three example, um, we're going to look a lot of, at liquidity. Right. So um, again, this is where we start to assess liquidity. And we've got to talk a little bit more about this. But meanwhile, I'm going to take another break so I can enjoy my yoga mati and then we can come back and talk about liquidity all right so um I'm back uh yeah I needed to drink my yoga mati <laughs> so there was just no way I was going to be able to continue this if I didn't but um in any case I'm back so let's take a look at step three examples all right so now we should have been able to come one time frame down and if we go back, if we remember what we discussed at step three, we're coming down to the time frame where we can observe liquidity. Now, this is, like I said, it's true for stocks, right? Um, you might look, need to look at another time frame for, say, something like Forex, for example. But don't worry, I will have a whole 
another uh, lesson set around just Forex. Every absolutely thing you need to know about Forex, I'm going to be able to tell you. Like I said, guys, the idea about this is to make it so in-depth that you're not going to need another course, right? It's pointless. I'm just going to put it all there so you can see. And if you're still looking to do another course and, you know, because again, there are a lot of people out there who've got programs where some will tell you that, hey, I only trade the S&P 500 and what I'm going to show you only works on the S&P 500. Now, you don't have to be a genius to work out that something fishy, if it only works on the S&P 500, markets tend to do similar things you know there might be nuances like i said to you you know if you're trying to if you're trying to do um say for example forex um you're gonna have to look on the daily as opposed to like uh weekly for example um for liquidity but the idea that you have to search for liquidity doesn't actually go away that's just constant and that's the point about this is that i want to be able to give you a methodology that you can use in any market i mean i mean do you honestly believe that you know the 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 money managers of this world are wasting all this time <laughs> trying to work out, you know, some some strategy that only works on the S and P five hundred. I don't think so. But anyway, I'm rambling. I'm gonna stop. Right. So let's take a look at some of the concepts that we need to discuss around liquidity. Now, what is when I talk about liquidity? Now, what we're basically saying is that where are the most orders? at the moment and what is what's the what's the most common order type now we know that market orders are instant orders right so that you click the button buy and the mark the orders execute into the market so you're a buyer or a seller at that point but prior to that no one knows you exist right so you could be sitting you could be the billion dollar trader sitting on your computer waiting to hit buy or sell of course a billion dollar trader won't do that but let's just say you were you are waiting to hit by yourself. So these are what we call orders that we don't know exist. We don't know when they're going to hit the market. There's no prediction. We just have no clue. Those are market orders. Now, the most common order types, though, are not market orders. They are limit orders and stop orders. Now, let's think about what we use them for. Limit orders are to get us in at the best possible price. So let's say, for example, let's take this. Um, I'm going to just use this bar as, as an example. So let's say $69.80. Someone might have a buy limit here. Right, so they're willing to buy at $69.80. Right, that's their limit order. We don't know why they set it there. We have no clue. Frankly, we don't care. Right, but we just know that $69.80, there were clearly a lot of buy limits there because the market rose. It's just obvious, right? So there are a lot of buys. Otherwise, um, there would be no reason for the algorithm to spool higher because it only went higher because it was trying to search for liquidity on the upside. Right, so we already know this, right, intuitively, right, so there were, um, if the price goes up, we make the natural deduction that there were buyers involved, right, so that's kind of, you know, that caused the algorithm to spool higher, right, so let's think about this for a second, right, so just hold on that point, right, so m most, most professionals would use limit orders, because it, like, we discussed what a limit order is, and if you don't remember, go back to the next slide, or I'll go back to the, the next, um, it's not the next slide, but the, the explanation on what a limit order is, so you can get the picture. The next most common order is a stop order. The reason being is that most people use stop orders to get them out of position. So stop loss orders, I should say. So these could be buy stop loss orders or sell stop loss orders. I call them buy stop orders and sell stop orders here, but really we're talking about stop loss orders. Some of them will be fresh orders to execute into a sales trade. That doesn't matter. We're not talking about that now. Um, but some of those will form part of that order set. And there will be definitely limit orders there as well. All right. So let's think about this for a second. Right. Stop, stop loss orders and limit orders are going to be the most used orders. So essentially, those orders are what we call passive orders. They're in the book. Right. So they're in the central order book, but they haven't been triggered yet. So essentially people know that they're there their presence is visible so if you've ever seen a depth of market for example you've seen a ladder you can actually see the passive orders and if it means that you can see it others can see it and the mar and the algorithms will go to those orders in order to fill them, right that's liquidity now in some cases those orders are so much that only you know the market can't really fill them all to go higher so it can fill some 
but then it runs out and then it's going to reverse, right? So this is all the distribution of liquidity, but we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go. So the concept I want you to understand is that the market will always go to the place where the most traders have orders, be it limit or stop loss orders, and they're going to be looking always to trade against those traders. And what do I mean by that? Okay, so let's say that we know that there were a lot of buyers here at 69.80. Their stop losses are going to be under 69.80, the vast majority of them, right? Now, let's say these people have a really long horizon and they're looking at 140. Now, some inexperienced people will have stops there. Some of them will be sell stop orders by people who have the idea that as soon as the market trades under the support, you, you've heard that word before, haven't you? Support. As soon as the market trades under the support, it's going to keep going lower, right? So that's uh, that's their risk point. So they put a sell stop order there, so they get triggered in. That's kind of the general retail trader type ideology, right? Breakout trades. We've heard that word before. So there'll be a lot of orders to sell basically down here, right? Um, and that's essentially a, a place of interest because it means that there's more than likely a lot of liquidity there. But what else will be there? It's a support level. Beneath it, there's going to be a lot of limit orders because the people who want to buy at the most efficient pr price know the inexperienced traders are busy selling down here and the more risk averse traders have stop loss orders down here. And all of those orders are sell orders. And when you sell something to someone, what does that make them? It makes them a buyer. So that means that that has to be the best place in order to sit with a buy order, because then that convinces the most people when we trade underneath this level that the market is going down, which generates an abundance of sell orders, which means you can then buy into that liquidity. Or it's going to create a lot of people panicking and rushing to sell their positions as well in the form of stop loss orders. Now, because you know that there's an element of panic down here and there's an abundance of sell orders, then essentially the algorithm goes, takes out those orders and then moves higher. Now, that algorithm, you've got to think about this. That algorithm isn't working for free. It's not doing, it's doing this for a master. And that master wants to make money. And the only way that master can make money is against the majority of people who are going to be wrong and those are going to be the sellers at this price. I hope this made sense. So at this point, we can clearly see that we have sell stop orders here. Market goes higher. There'll be likely buy stops orders up here. Trades a little higher, grabs that liquidity, comes back under this level, trades lower, bounces around a little bit. So again, we know that there, there would have been sellers here. So there'll be buy stop orders here, goes down, liquidity hunt trades, takes out the stops here, fills the limit orders here, does a lot of liquidity business down here. Most of those limit orders are going to be market makers like themselves, people who are highly experienced and know what they're doing. They're going to be positioned in a buy and the algorithm too is buying at that level, All right? So at this point, they're holding the majority of the asset at very, very efficient prices. So tell me again, do you think it's essential to do technical analysis or is it not? Right? How many people do you think would have been buyers at this price? Right? And just think about how much money they're bleeding on their portfolios. Think about the people who are buyers up here. Right? How much money are they bleeding? So there's a lot of people who are going to tell you just buy and hold, right? Because, well, they're hoping for a break even. They're hoping for the market to reverse because they've technically, they've paid a poor price. Of course, the market reversed, but the price you get is going to dictate your return. The person buying at $69.80 certainly is going to make a higher return than the person buying at 86. I don't care how much DCA in you're doing, right? So having that perception of where the stop orders are, where the liquidity grab's going to be. Again, you see above those buy stop orders, we go, we get a liquidity hunt, we come back down, right? There's going to be sell stop orders here. Right, so we go up a bit, we get another liquidity hunt against these buy stop orders. It comes down, we get a liquidity hunt against those. So this is what we call an accumulation phase or reaccumulation in this case. So it's kind of an accumulation of a lot of the asset at efficient prices by professionals and market makers. 
right? So the algorithms, right? Because market makers are now just the algorithms, right? They're making money for their masters. So we're going to see a lot of this going on, right? And this is where we want to be buyers at these liquidity breakpoints, right? So just when we take out those 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 stop losses, that's where we want to be buyers. So we know their sell stop losses on there. Liquidity increases, so we want to buy at that level. If we take that approach, we're hardly ever going to be wrong. Of course, there's a lot more risk in shorting the stock. So in this case, our, this is Moog Inc. And Moog went up, and now a lot of people want to short Moog. But you look at the fundamentals of Moog, they're making money. It's a low float company. Why the hell would you want to short them? Today, it's trading at $140 a share. Good luck to the guys who are shorting at 86. Right? So I, this is not something I recommend, but if you are a buyer of Moog, you had an opportunity to buy Moog here. You had an opportunity to buy Moog here, right? On those liquidity breaks. Here, you've got another late one. You've got uh, sell stops here. Market f creates a fake, like it's going down reverses liquidity hunt right it starts to close up above 92 we want to be buyers you can see that gap here right price gap top right that's 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 insane we're gapping up against the week right it's a big gap up and then look look what happens it's because the sellers are trapped they all went short thinking moog was going to collapse but then it doesn't rebounds so these are the kind of nuances now we don't want to be short because then we have to make a two-way decision Okay, is it going to go down this time or going to go up? So having that directional bias from the monthly time frame gives you that perception. So when you come into the weekly time frame, it all adds up, right? So you now know, okay, I want to be long this stock. I don't want to be short at any point. You know, they're, of course, they're greedy people who are going to want to play these swings, but they're going to lose the most money because they're greedy. Right, so I know my name says greedy trader, but that's not what I meant. I meant that we, we don't want to leave money on the table. That's what we call greedy. So if we're, we we want to take good positions, we want to be we want to be uh, responsible managers, but we don't want to leave anything on the table. We want to be greedy, and that's why we look for these efficiencies. We don't want to buy here. Why would I want to buy here? I'm a greedy guy. I want to buy down here. These are the levels I'm looking for. I'm not looking for these. Yeah, of course, on, you know, when you see a continuation, you can add to your existing positions. But I definitely want to make sure that when I see these outcomes on weekly charts, those are the things I'm looking for in well-balanced fundamental companies. I hope the message is really hammering home. That's why I say, guys, this, this course is all about proof. I'm going to show you proof. I'm not just going to tell you that oh, you do this, do that. I'm going to show you and I've got tons more proof to show you. Okay, so on to the next slide. So we, let's have a look, let's see. So we're looking at Elbit Systems Limited. So again, we're talk, talking about liquidity. So as you can see here, uh, what would be sitting up here? So people here are short, gonna have buy stops. Liquidity. So we can see the market goes up. Uh, oh, um, before we get to that point, the people sitting here are going to have what sell stops. So we can see the market traded down, rebounded a little bit, came back, took liquidity. Those um, sell stops get triggered, stop loss orders, sell stop loss orders get triggered, buy limit orders get triggered against that. And those buy limits are going to be largely with professionals, um, people in the know, market makers. And then you can see we close a little bit higher and then we go all the way, take out the liquidity on the uh, on the uh, short side. So here, what's going to be here? Lots of buy stops, um, buy, buy stop loss orders. So there's going to be a lot going on here. And then you can see we go up a little bit, we hold and then we break down. And then what does that do? Comes all the way back down, takes out the liquidity here. So it takes out more liquidity. What's going to be here? Buy stops. Again, and then it rallies. This time we see a lot of sellers here. We come back down. This time we sort of trade within this range. We don't really take out any liquidity. We form a bottom in 2021. We go back up. Uh, we take short-term liquidity, 
come back down, take short term liquidity here and then go back up. You can see we'll talk about flow rotation in a minute, but you can see here that we start going and what what's going to be here again. So this is what we call a trap, right? So what's going to be here and um, they're likely to be buy stops. So we break through them, breaks, bring some liquidity. We have some additional information now that tells us that we're probably not going to come back down again, but we'll talk about that in subsequent slides. So what do we do? Take liquidity, we fake the market, and this creates what we call a short squeeze. So people who are now going to go short this company, unaware of the fundamental information, um, now start to find that it gets incredibly difficult to get short. So again, if you're a buyer and not trying to get short, you wouldn't have been squeezed here for one. Secondly, you had lots of opportunities to observe the liquidity hunts. So you can see them here. So again, you can think about the return, right? So you think on this move up, that was a 44% return. On this move up here, again, you can see even if we were sort of trying to already get this to the high, it was a 42% return. Again, you can see from the liquidity hunt here, it was a 38% return. So if you look at that as a cumulative return, right? Let's say at every point you were buying 100 shares and staying in this as a, well, not staying in it, but liquidating and coming back and buying some more as a cumulative effect of that would be quite exponential in terms of capital. So that is how professionals make money. It is not by trading in, trading out every day consistent. No, it's usually paying attention to these kind of moves. And that's what you want to be a back. It doesn't matter the stock you're looking at. All stocks display the same pattern. You just have to be looking at credible companies. Ah, sorry. Again, um, another example. So here we go. We see that there's a short, there's a short term bottom here. Market's trading up. What should be down below here? Sell stops. Market goes, takes the liquidity, goes up slightly and breaks down, right? So it's a trap. So early buyers got trapped here. We put in another short, um, another short term bottom and then we rise a little bit, go up, take liquidity, go up, take liquidity. Right. So we've been doing this consistently and we get a nice little rally where the sellers were. What's on top here? Buy stops. Takes liquidity, comes back down, takes liquidity and then rallies. Right. Goes back up, takes liquidity, comes back down, short term liquidity, comes back down. We failed to do that the second time around. We break down. Now we don't take liquidity. Right. So again, this is a different type of setup. So we see sellers here. And we've risen a little bit. The general expectation is if we don't have the additional information I'm going to teach you about now, then ultimately we will look for another liquidity grab, right? This could be a short term liquidity grab. We don't know. Right. So that is the, that is the way that we want to approach the market. So this is another example. I really wanted to focus here on the trap, right? But again, it didn't matter. Even if you were late here, you could have dollar cost averaged in. Uh, these liquidity gaps, we had a big move to the top. You would look to take profits here. We came down, you could have bought again, look to take profits just above the liquidity high. And then you see we bounced here. Obviously there's some more information here that might have prompted you to be long again on a continuation trade, get out here and then you're done. Right. And what we, again, we're not going to really try and attempt to get into this market until we can see another short term. Uh, liquidity hunt, either we come down, trade, recover, or we come down, trade, recover. So what's a great buying price? 134.60. That's a good buying price, right? Below that is a good buying price. Below 139 is a good buying price, right? So we want to be, we want to be mindful of this kind of stuff. Yeah. So that, that's the, that's the basic there. <clears throat> Sorry. That needed to happen. Okay, so let's take a look. So here's another example. Again, another step three example, looking for liquidity. So again, you can see the stock was going in, put in a short term bottom, rallied. This would have been a good buy level. So again, we can see the sellers here, liquidity trap. So here again, you can see we go, we go a little bit and we break down. Now, what I'm trying to get you to see here is that it's not always going to work, right? You're going to find yourself trapped into trades from time to time. But when you're on the long side, you can recover from that either by averaging in, 
You should, there are also other pieces of information you can look for. And the likelihood that you would have come back to break even in under a year was pretty high. Right. And that's because you're taking on good sort of principles and fundamentals in terms of when we access these assets. Right. So we're trying to stay long. There was a lot of short opportunity. Don't get me wrong. Um, let's see another example. So here we, we go down, trade up liquidity. Let's say you get short here. You see the break. You think, well, this is it. Liquidity hunt. We're going down. It's a trap. Market goes, squeezes everybody out. Right. So this is what we call a short squeeze. Takes out liquidity above 11.726. Right. This is Bitcoin, by the way. I thought I'd throw Bitcoin in here. And then again, you can see we start to push much lower. Right. You can see the sellers. There's a lot of sell interest here. And then we get a liquidity hunt around here. Right. So just under four, um, 4,351 in Bitcoin. All right. So this is going back to the 2020 cycle when COVID happened. All right. For those of people who, but, but who, who don't understand that it doesn't matter. It could be a pandemic. It could be a car crash. The market will use any excuse to spool lower in order to get bids. All right. And clearly there was a liquidity hunt here. So there was evidence that we were going to spool lower despite we see liquidity grabs here, here, and here, but with Bitcoin, we were late in the cycle, right? The COVID was just the bot bottoming out of that cycle, right? So obviously in Bitcoin, the fundamentals are different because we're not talking about stock here. With Bitcoin, we have to consider the halving cycles. So there's one in 2016, there was one in 2020. So there was an expectation that we're going to get that 85% correction that we had in our cycle analysis of Bitcoin. Right, which makes Bitcoin fundamentally would be, would have been bearish into this part of the cycle. So we had a big extreme up move. We expect bearishness. And it's the exact same thing that we're looking for right now is that are we going to get a bearish drop on Bitcoin that is going to create a liquidity hunt, for example, right? And if you look from that under 3K Bitcoin, we went up again. If you don't understand the Bitcoin cycle, we were by then we were almost into November 2020. Right. So that's when we really get the altcoin rally and also a very big Bitcoin move. And you would have seen again, we go, we take out liquidity. What's above here? Buy stops. Right. And so we see those buy stop losses triggered. Right. It acts like it's going back down and then people get short and then we get a short squeeze. We saw that here. We saw that here. Now, if you don't believe me, just go online, Google and during this period, how many people were squeezed, right? So just go on to something like, I don't know, Binance Futures and see how many people got short squeezed who were short in Bitcoin and didn't know what they were doing. All right, so um, this is something that we see more or less time and time and time again. And it's one of those important aspects that we ultimately uh, need to take note of. So once again, that's another example, guys. I did tell you, going to be pretty big on proof. What else do we have? So here again, we can see um, step four example, liquidity again. So we're still pushing out. So I really want this to be clear. Uh, so we got Coinbase. So here again, stop, stop losses. What sits underneath here? I'll let you guys tell me. So we got sell stops, liquidity, Coinbase goes up. Again, you see us go down, take out more liquidity. We act like we're going up. We stall for a little bit, take out short-term liquidity, come down, take out long-term liquidity, and then we get a signal. This is a daily chart, right? So step four, what are we talking about? So now we're combining liquidity. So our understanding of liquidity and float rotation. So what is float rotation? So this essentially is extreme volume spikes where a share is traded over and over again in the course of a single day. So basically we get a lot of activity. So if you think about it, it's like when you go to a Black Friday, a Black Friday sh sale, right? So there's a sale going on and everyone wants to be in that day. So there's a lot of activity, a lot of velocity of money. So money's changing hand consistently so much that it's obvious that a large entity has entered the market and is trying to suck up the supply. And that's what creates these extreme volume spikes you'll see. These are similar to our Black Friday days. So you can clearly see the resulting price action 
is that we go down liquidity grab there's not a lot going on there this is the big one right so you can see us gap back up over 50 you need to be a buyer what does that result in coinbase goes all the way to 111 and by the way if you come to my discord server i spoke exactly about this i was in this particular trade and i was saying to everyone this is the moment when coinbase is going to go because i was targeting and now at that point hundred dollars a share in the extreme move that we're going to see what did we get we got that and then we got a huge profit take just about a hundred a share and then the market comes down and that was here the volume spike here right so when we when we come down a time frame we're now looking to combine the liquidity that we know about in the weekly time frame and we want to combine that with what we can see in the daily so the daily will give us good short-term liquidity levels so if we wanted to trade more down the route of swing where we don't want to be in the trade for longer than two or three months for example um, then we would pretty much or we don't let's say we don't even want to be in the trade for longer than a month right so you can clearly see that you would have had some decent profits between march and april um, you can also see there were some good profits as well between may and june but even if you got caught out in the short term liquidity drop you can then just buy more and then that would have given you stellar profits over june july and august like myself so this was a perfect opportunity for you to double your money which for me was a sure bet so i was heavy in coinbase and i doubled my money just like that right over 50 dollars a share right because i'm it's not because i'm a genius it's because i'm taking into account good principles now one of the things that was a little bit wrong about coinbase was that it was losing money coinbase is negative 2.6 billion at that point but what we do know about coinbase is it's innovative technology so one of the things that you can look at this is true for electric vehicle anything any industry that is on the cusp of transformation is going to change the way humans see the world or what they do people will pay anything for it it's not really a question of whether coin i mean obviously you know we don't think coinbase is going to go under even though they're losing money now but by the time we peak in the bitcoin cycle they're going to be make money because their business model is what's different the more people trading these bitcoins and these altcoins they're all going to go do it on coinbase's exchange and um, also there's clearly players who knew what was going to happen to binance right that it wasn't fit for the u.s market and that's millions and millions of people who are not going to be able to use any other exchange other than Coinbase. So these factors sometimes can change or influence whether you wanted to participate in this company or not. But the thing we can't dispute is if you're going to participate, then this is how you want to do it. <laughs> that's it. There's no other way. I, sh you know, I kid you not. If you want to go and listen to someone tell you some other rubbish, then good luck. I wish you well. I hope you're highly successful down the line. Again, another example. So here we see Apple. Apple's a stock we all know. So I, I just want to hammer home the point that it's not different. If we're looking at larger companies, we might get less of a return, right? Because again, a lot of these stocks are in play by everyone, but it's the same same principle. So let's see for an example. So here's here are the idiots who are shorting Apple, right? Goes up, they get a short squeeze, right? So we can clearly see that. So you see the, vo the float, Float increased on the day. Everyone thinks it's going down. They get squeezed. The market rallies very, very strongly. Right? How do we know? Um, well, the moment we started to trade into this tail here with this solid bull candle, it was evident that we're going to go higher. We also know that there were a ton of buyers here. Right? It's where the consolidation was. So again, you can see we traded short-term liquidity. We traded slightly, not quite under, and then we bounced. Right? So clearly, there was a lot of interest at these levels so this is what's going to be underneath here right remember sell stops uh sell stop losses all of that's going to be under here so people are going to want to sell at a cheap premium here so again see the market goes down we trade liquidity here short term and we rebound good return right so but again if you look at what's underneath all of here sell stops it's a big large cap stock company right you can see the float rotation every time people step up to the plate so people were happy to buy apple on the way down because it's a legitimate company it didn't matter the price they paid so people were excited because they already knew that this is a safe company it's going to go up by 20 or 30 points 40 50 60 points in the next couple of years so buying it at 170 is a bargain and then you can see that liquidity hunt just underneath the lows and then we close up 170 
That's where you want to get involved. So again, we get a short-term liquidity hunt, but it's on low float rotation, right? So there's no sellers at 180 anymore, right? Everyone knows that they don't need to be a seller, right? We go down, get a liquidity grab again, close up, 170. That's where you want to pay. Now today, we're trading, at the time of this, it was 190 a share. We can see the evidence here, increased float rotation. So these volume spikes, they're not on your charts. These are, this is what we call level one volume, right? You've got to understand this. They're not on your charts for fun. Level one volume is incredibly important to know, right? And of course, we're looking at the daily. This could be your trading time frame if you're more short term oriented, right? So you don't want to stay in a trade for longer than a month or two. Then this is your time frame. There's no other time to look at time frame. This is it. Um, you would have had a top down approach. So you've come from step one, step two, step three, and this is step four, guys. And so this is becomes short term trading time frames, right? And again, if you're an intraday trader, this becomes your your you know this. You need to go down another level. But for me, I'm not really interested in that, right? So from where you are, you should be able to make decent money without gambling your life away. So let's look at another example. So this is um, EPAM Systems. This is the company that I own, by the way. And I bought this really cheap, right? So again, you can see here, um, massive float rotation. Company goes up several, several, several points. Pulls back. We see a few liquidity traps here, but we don't really get a bounce. So it's not really a liquidity trap, but we definitely see short term liquidity trap here. We go down and then what do we do, right? We post underneath the low recover liquidity. Nice little tail here. It's a good level, 213 to 218. Where are we today? We're trading 262 a share, right? And no doubt we're going to find liquidity, maybe short term liquidity up here, or we get a squeeze. Now I'm anticipating because of time frame, top down approach that we might get a fake out of the 267 and then a short term squeeze. Today, uh, we were pre-market 262.74. Right, so this is the stuff you got to look out for. All right, so another example, step four example, again, we see this is a uh, th Thermo Fisher. So again, pull down, put a short term uh, spike, increase float rotation, liquidity grab. What do we do? We go up, take out short term liquidity, come down a bit of a trap here. You can see the in increased short side liquidity. People eager to cr press this lower. The moment we took out the lows, we want it, you know, even if you're late, this would have been a good level to step out, right? Because obviously you can see that there was a lot of sell pressure from that float rotation. And by the way, I'm using, I say sell pressure, but really there's a lot of active people basically getting filled at this price and the algorithm spool lower. Likely to get the market, market makers in in a better price and then trap all these longs who took the bait here. This happens. There's nothing you can do about it. Again, we recovered, right? We're, good, we're likely going to recover to break even. So even if you're unlucky to buy at 517, you know, holding on for a few months, you're going to be back at even. But or you could dollar cost average, right? So we pull down, big float rotation here, and then you want to get involved at this point, right? Because you can see that this might have been a longer term liquidity grab. You'd have to go back and look at the month, look at the weekly chart to see where we were trading, right? So that's the reason we can't lose sight of the bigger picture. But again, I have no doubt with such a strong float rotate, we're going to be searching liquidity over 517, over 559, because what do we have here? We're going to have sellers and we definitely know there were sellers here. So this is going to be a liquidity level 540 to 559 and so on, right? This could even be a short squeeze, right? Depending on the economic cycle. Again, another example. Um, we can see that here, short term liquidity uh, set again. You can see that we get increased float rotation. We go up short term liquidity trade lower. Again, you can see that liquidity grab here. We're up and now you can see we're much, much higher, right? So again, it's the same pattern. It just keeps repeating itself. What's beneath the lows? That's the question you ask yourself. What is beneath the lows? All right, guys, so time for some homework. Whew. It's been a session, right? It's been long, 
I'm exhausted. <laughs> but no, guys, I'm hoping this is value. So exercise one, go back, do a top-down approach on any five stock that meets the basic fundamental criteria for ownership. And if you don't remember that, go and look at the previous lessons. Example, share supply, profitability. Do we have that? Five stocks. Exercise two, see if you can identify any historical float rotation on what time frame if you're trading stocks? The daily. If you see any float rotation increases, would have that been would that have been a buying opportunity for you? Put it, make it real in numbers. How much money do you have? How much would you have bought if you knew about what I'm telling you now? How much would you have made? Would it have changed your life? Think about it. Maybe you're a risky kind of guy. Like uh, I'm going to teach you guys about proper management as we go along. But let's make the assumption that you're a risky kind of guy. And I think management becomes important when we get into things like Forex or futures because they're leverage products. When I'm talking about equities, I'm not focused a lot on the risk management side, but I'm going to have a whole section dedicated to that. But let's pretend for a second you're a risky guy and you're willing to throw everything, right? It's the kitchen sink, it's all coming, like hundreds of thousands, right? Would it have changed your life? Would you have sold your house and done? I want you to think about this, right? Think about how much money you have on the sidelines to invest or to trade, whatever you want to do or what you want to call it. Think about it and think about what you were seeing historically on those charts based on the information you now know. Is this something that you would have done? Right, so I want you to think about it. Right, really important. Now, again, um, I would like you to look at liquidity hunts. I would like you to look at float rotations. Annotate them on your chart so you remember them. So they start to sear into your brain. Go through countless charts. I'm not talking one or two charts like I've done for you now in examples. I want you to go to 50, 60, 70, 100 charts and see what the probability was if you did two or three trades in a year, how much money would you have made? Like, just think about it. It doesn't matter how much you have to, to invest, 20, 10, 5. How, what would that have been if you'd taken those opportunities? Think about it. All right, awesome stuff, guys. Um, thank you very much uh, for sitting through this. I know it's been, it was long for me. But this is important. This is the journey. And I told you guys before that I'm going to make you sit through these things so you'll see who's got the staying power. Because when I want you, when you finish this, I want you to succeed. I want people to come back to me and said, this stuff was amazing. It changed my life and I'm succeeding. I don't want people to come back and say, oh, I started the course. I'm not understanding this. It's, uh, I mean, you know, I don't want that because that means that you're not paying attention. You don't have the staying power. So you're probably not going to make any money trading or investing full stop or you're going to do what those people tell you to do on podcasts which is put your money in the S&P 500 right because they haven't done the maths you're not going to make 10% annually inflation is going to do the damage that it needs to do you're not going to make that money right the 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 US dollar is devalued at 7% 10% 7% annually most other currencies are going to be devalued at 10 15 20% i mean just look at argentina right? do you think someone in argentina is you know, I mean, just think about it, guys. Um, you know, that's all. Think about it. Awesome stuff, guys. Um, till the next lesson. Adios. Hey, listen, I, I quit. Yeah, I'm going in the stocks. Name of the game. Move the money from your client's pocket into your pocket. But if you can make your client's money at the same time, it's advantageous to everyone, correct? No. No one is paying attention. It's unbelievable. You have to act. God, this is intimate. I feel like I'm financially inside of you or something. Okay. I have five houses and a condo. I'm considering going long on April week. What do you think, Valentine?